Welcome to Foolproof Theology. I'm glad to have you here again today for another great episode with a great guest. We're going to have Ben Merkel on the show today, the president of New St. Andrews College up in Moscow, not Moscow, Idaho. And I'm just really glad to have him on. We're going to talk about Christian higher ed. We're going to talk about Christian colleges, the university system as a whole. And so we can get into a lot of different areas in this conversation. So Ben, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. A pleasure to be here. So you're up at New St. Andrews. How long have you been the president up there? Uh, a little over eight years, uh, but eight I years. started teaching there, gosh, somewhere in the late 90s and have been there kind of either full time or part time ever since. OK, so you have a lot of history with it. You you originally got your you know, you did your academic work in Hebrew. I think I heard that uh, through the grapevine on some other podcast. Were you teaching Hebrew at New St. Andrews or what are some of the things you were teaching before you became president? I did. I did teach Hebrew. My main my main teaching was the um, freshman theology course. Um, that was definitely my focus. Um, I did spend some time in Hebrew, but it, I, I, I'm not a pure linguist. You know, it was um, I was in, intrigued in the language, but more what it opened up than necessarily just a pure philologist kind of guy. Yeah, I'm curious about this theology because um, you know. Lots of institutions, lots of Christian colleges will use different textbooks, different influences. What's the approach to theology at New St. Andrews? Is there a systematic that you guys use? Is there one book that's like, if you graduate from New St. Andrews, you know, everybody's going to read this book. How do you all approach that at New St. Andrews? Yeah, it's more of a stack of books. Um, so there's there's a, a kind of a combination with regard to theology of um, there's a bit of a great books approach and that you're going to. Everybody's going to read Augustine's City of God Confessions. Everybody's going to read Calvin's Institutes. Um, there's a whole stack of you know great texts that they're going to work through. Um, but then there's um, put on top of that more of a, um, a con uh, we try to make sure that they get a, a, a consistent reformed un understanding of reformed systematic theology. So they're going to get a confessional reformed uh, overview. And then, um, and then mixed in with that, there's a good bit of just that practical Christianity that I think Moscow is fairly known for, uh, just what it means to live a faithful life. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's funny when I look at New, New St. Andrews, I'll meet people all over the place. And it's like, oh, that guy went to New St. Andrews. Oh, that guy went to, it's a, it's a very, you have a very wide uh, reach in terms of, you know, uh, impact culturally. So I really appreciate what you guys are doing there. I know some of the professors you've got there. I wanted to talk about Christian higher ed. Um, New St. Andrews, as far as I know, doesn't take any government funding. What mm -hmm. makes New St. Andrews even more unique, though, amongst other Christian colleges in America? Yeah, so um, the, the no federal uh, federal money is a big piece. I mean, that narrows you down to just a handful of schools. That is one piece. I think another thing that is distinct about us is the fact that we um, only give one undergraduate degree in liberal arts, a general liberal arts degree. We don't specialize according to professional majors, which is the way most colleges do it. Um, and then I think also we are fairly known for being rather robust and um, clear in our convictions. We're, we're, we're pretty clear on what we believe and we speak into the microphone when we talk about it. Um, and I think that that's distinct from most colleges, which tend to want to um, hedge their bet quite a bit and, and kind of be a little more subtle. Yeah. I'm on the board of a Christian school here in Boulder County and uh, I remember watching your ad that I think it was a new St. Andrews ad put out with the restrooms and, you know, it was men and women. And it was basically, you know, saying, you know, if you come here, we're not going to teach this kind of nonsense about transgenderism. And I was trying yeah. to talk to our school board and I was like, that's the kind of ad I want to run. And everybody and everybody in the, else in the room was like, no, 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 let's not do that. But it's, it's a really inspiring posture. You'll yeah. take talking about speaking into the microphone, that kind of thing. Um, and so I'm curious about, the people who come to New St. Andrews, the freshmen and all these, what are some of the backgrounds you see that, that come into uh, the college? Do you see anybody that's, that's not a Christian, uh, all of a sudden a recent Christian come and apply and, and get in, or who's, who's coming to New St. Andrews? So we do require that our students um, be, um, uh, uh, well, not reformed, but that they be an evangelical Protestant, and that they be ready to attend a local evangelical Protestant church. So if you were not a Christian, you wouldn't be able to sign, sign the statement of faith or code of conduct. Um, but I would say we do have a fairly broad 
incoming class. So um, we are, as a school, confessionally reformed, which means the faculty are reformed and the com- curriculum is going to be reformed. But but the students can be any number of broad evangelical um, backgrounds. And, and then we tend to get a whole lot of different kinds. Um, they... I think that one fairly consistent common denominator is that they're in some way coming out of the classical Christian K to 12 world. Uh, we really, we really exist to serve that pipeline. Now, some kids, maybe 10% come from outside of that, but the bulk of them have that kind of background. Um, and I know for a lot of students, they feel like, okay, if I did classical K to 12, um, why would I go to a, uh, why would I go and sign up to do it for another four years? But the whole point is that that education was getting you ready to do this whole new thing. It really is a different new level of, of, of um, looking at this kind of curriculum, these kinds of materials. And it's the thing that you, that whole education was preparing you for. So we tend to get a lot of kids out of that. Um, in terms of like location, our kids come from all over, like probably less than 30% are from the Pacific Northwest. They come from all over the U.S. and really all over the world. We get a lot of international kids as well. That's awesome. One of the things I'm I'm curious about with Christian higher, higher education is there's a whole kind of in the United States and, and really globally uh, kind of uh, credentialism, uh, accreditation, you it kind of like, and, and I'll be honest, you know, like I'll see a lot of charismatics from charismatic background churches. And it's like a lot of charismatic churches will start their own like college of ministry or something like that. Yeah. And so how does New St. Andrews navigate the landscape of accreditation? Because as much as I, I was one way and now I'm kind of like, I, I often poo poo on credentialism and I'm like, whatever, like I don't even care anymore because it all seems so corrupt. How did y'all navigate the accreditation process in the United States? It's, it, it is a, um, there's a, it's one of those classic things where there's a ditch on both sides of the road, because on the one hand, um, we, you know, what you're describing with, the um, you know, uh, everybody's a PhD, um, you know, and, and, and you just give away degrees and diplomas like they're candy. Um, there's something really good about having an external, um, standard that comes along and actually holds you accountable to some really true high standards of rigor. And, um, sadly, I would say in the evangelical Christian world, those standards of rigor are pretty stinking low. And so, um, I, think it's good to look to push yourself to um, try to achieve at a higher level. At the same time, um, those same standards that come in from outside are very susceptible to being um, maneuvered by uh, well, or, or, or taken over by forces that want to use that external standard to slowly work away at your convictions and principles. And how you stay alert and know this is good, this is bad. You just have to always be on top of it. So um, NSA, we have um, our, we were initially accredited by TRAX, which is a national Christian accreditation agency um, that has been um, good at, rep- uh, you know, it, it was great for us in that it gave us all the privileges of of having an accredited degree. Um, and it was, we were being reviewed by uh, evangelical Christians who shared our convictions on a number of things. Um, we recently added what um, accreditation that was formerly known as regional accreditation. It's still, everybody thinks of it as regional, even though that distinction formally has been um, uh, un, you know, done away with. Anyhow, so we added that accreditation um, this last summer, which gives our degree, it's a lot more rigorous in terms of their examination of us, but it's secular. And so you have that like, okay, so what happens here? So what my take was every time I would meet with them, I would say at the very front, here's our convictions on marriage. Here's our convictions on gender. Here's, you know, we're not going to, I would try to put it out there right at the front end to say, you know, does this scare you away? And um, we were, we were surprised at how much um, they uh, encouraged us to, not think that that was a problem. And when they finally did the accreditation visit, we actually, um, usually you have a three year interim sort of probational period. They skipped that whole period for us and brought us into full accreditation right at the beginning, which is almost unheard of. And then we got a series of commendations and, and the first three commendations all had to do with our commitment to our vision and commending us on how clear we were on that and urging us to lean into that religious identity as much as possible. 
I was pretty surprised by that, to be honest. Um, so it's been good, but I just feel like you, you know, the whole, the rule is don't put your hand out further than you can take it back. So we've continued with our um, tracks accreditation. If this somehow gets us to the point where we're going to be compromised, you take it back. Um, and I've, I've already done this where I, I, um, you know, early on, I pushed us to be a part of the CCCU, the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities, um, uh, did all the work to get in, showed up for the first meeting and was like, this is a problem. Um, <laughs> it's deeply compromised and, um, then took a couple of years to then pull us back out. Um, and so I think it's okay to step into those worlds as long as you have the courage and conviction to pull yourself out or to stand up and say the awkward thing when things go bad. You know, I, I, I showed up at the CCCU right when the whole fairness for all um, thing was going down. I don't know if you know that whole story, but it was, it was a initiative where Christian colleges were trying to basically make a deal with the homosexual lobby to sign on with the homosexual lobby on a whole host of things. We would have thrown the Christian cake baker under the bus, the florist under the bus. You know, we would have thrown them all under the bus with the um, one proviso is that we would get an exemption for our own campuses, um, which is, um, I think, cowardly and concedes at the very front end the argument that you're trying to make. Um, and so I remember showing up to the meeting. I'm the only myself and one other president stood up to speak against the initiative. I think as long as you have the courage to stand up and speak at those kinds of moments and as long as you have the spine to pull yourself back out then it's okay to venture forward and, and take some, some risks. Um, and I think it's important to do so. Otherwise we're always in a retreat. We're never on the advance. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a huge thing because I think for a lot of people, they just assume Christian college must be good, but it's really important to look at like, you know, who they're associated with, what they're teaching, that kind of thing, how they're getting accredited and this accreditation stuff. I mean, from what I understand, even just being on a board of a local Christian school, it's like, this is a big deal in terms of the time required. You have to have people come in and vet the curriculum and that kind of stuff. So is that like every three years for you or how does that work up at New St. Andrews? So, well, um, with tracks, it's a 10 year deal. Like every 10th year you have a, a really intense thing. And every fifth year you have kind of a, a much lighter thing that can be done from a distance with our new Northwest accreditation. It's a seven year cycle with a, a thing in the middle as well. So, so we got like this crazy calendar where at any given moment you're, you're, you're doing some sort of reporting. Yeah. It's intense for sure. Um, yeah, one of, one of the things I think I'm noticing in, in the, the, there's stats to back this up with college today in America, particularly you've got more women than ever before going to college and more men not going to college. And so mm -hmm. there's a disparity there. Uh, and, and that's just a curious observation why that is, but also, you know, as, as I think about my own sons, they're 10 and eight. And, you know, the, the dream for me personally was, you know, I went to Texas A&M. My mom went to Texas A&M. My grandfather went to Texas A&M. I want them to go to Texas A&M. I don't know if that'll happen. We're out of state now. So I don't, you know, tuition is insane. Yeah. Um, but in the last few years, I've become really like cynical on just the whole, you know, higher education as like, you got to have it. On the one right. hand, I want them to have it because it is kind of a, uh, a way to meet, meet a spouse. It's a way to get cr uh, a better job in the world or so we've been told. But on the mm -hmm. other hand, I'm kind of like, dude, just go be a welder, you know, or go work on a pipeline yeah. or do something with your hands. Yeah. But you can make good money in industry without going to college. So, you know, how would you counsel somebody that's kind of like really jaded on college? Why is college a good thing? And, and should, why should they send their kids to college you know, given yeah. our day and age? Well, I think the first thing to do is to acknowledge that they're jaded for really good reasons. Like they're not imagining things. The, 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 their response to the state of current higher ed is correct. I mean, I, so I, I get it. Um, I think colleges are, um, are not delivering on a whole host of different fronts. One of the big ones has been the, um, the slow warping of, um, how we sell what a college degree is and what a college degree does. So the, the constant, um, the constant assumption is that a, you have to get a college degree in order to get a job. And that's what all colleges will tell you. You do this to get a job. And if you go on any college campus and ask, 
why, you know, why are you here? What are you doing here? Every student will tell you it's in order to be able to get a job. And the problem is, is that we just, it takes two seconds to just look at the world and say, that's not true. Like you, right. you, you don't need this degree to get that job and getting this degree does not promise you that job. It, right. it is, um, you know, the data on that is just so clear that, that this is a con. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with inflated tuitions uh, funded by inflated student loan debt, which is justified by the fact that it supposedly promises you a certain salary. Um, and the thing is, is that salary isn't guaranteed to you and you don't need that degree to get that salary. So so that whole thing has to be confessed. And like the whole, I don't know, world of higher education needs to step into the microphone and say, we've been telling you a lie. We're very sorry. This is not true. <laughs> Right. Um, so, so I think that's, that's the first thing. The, this, the, the second thing is like, an, uh, we need to restore proper understanding of what a college education really does. And I think inside of that, a, a broader appreciation for what education as a whole from K to 12 college, what does it do? There certainly is a professional element to it. I, I'm not, I'm not saying that your education and your job are, are completely unrelated. There is a professional element to it, but it's far different and far more complicated than what they're trying to make it out to be. And also there's a lot more than just a profession. A huge thing about education is education is enculturation. Um, you know, when, when, um, you know, if you get, uh, Doug Wilson, my, my father-in-law sort of, you know, grandfather of the classical Christian education movement, he's going to always go to, um, Paul in Ephesians and the paideia of God. You know, you, you've got to give your children the nurture and admonition of the Lord, the paideia of God, which is this education that is far greater than just vocational certification. It's about, um, it's about enculturation and appreciation and understanding of your people, where you came from, the cultural legacy that you have, what is good, what is true, what is beautiful, what is it you want to pass on to your children? What do you want to, you know, give your life to? And some of that is career, but some, but it's much larger than just that. And when you think of it, not just as a, you know, the culture of my people, but when you say my people are the people of God, then it's the enculturation into the gospel and the world that the gospel has made. And that is, massive. That is, that is huge. It is rich. And, um, and in removing all that from of our education and replacing it just with this vocational certification, we've lost this huge legacy that um, I just don't think that we've appreciated it. But I, but I do think over the last few years, we're starting to see the impact of having raised a generation um, well, probably two generations now of of students through this educational system that has been robbed of this older Christian enculturation. Um, even the unbelievers in America used to get this education. They might not have understood, um, they might not have had evangelical faith, but there was some sort of conviction and shared common assumption about what is true, good, and beautiful. You remove that, and the stupidity of our current American culture is the result of it. And so, People will say, okay, like, why do I need to study philosophy in order to get this job? Why do I need to study literature in order to have this job? And, and they're, they're just connecting the education to the job. Well, the thing is, is when you remove the Western philosophy, theology, historical tradition, understanding of our nation, when you remove all of that, that's how you get our current political moment. Right. And it's, it's not just that you can't get a job. It's like there isn't a job market. The whole right. thing closes down. Yeah. They do stupid things like quarantining everybody and saying we have to shut off all industry and think that it won't have financial consequences. Right. Like you, 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 we, we think that like, um, I don't need that for this job. No, you need this to have a world, a life, yeah. right. or to have a police force, to have like the rule of law some of the most basic things you have to work to preserve that. And the place where you work to preserve that is in education. Yeah. And I don't, I don't believe I, and then the last thing I would say is I don't believe that education that I'm describing is required for everybody. I, I, I think that um, college honestly is not for everybody. I think that maybe a third of students straight out of high school should just go straight into the workforce a third into some professional degrees and a third into this kind of liberal arts degree that I'm describing. But you do need at least a third of your P 
people to have received this kind of education because there's they, they will provide a cultural leadership that that creates the world in which we can all live um, peacefully and faithfully and all of that. Yeah, that makes complete sense. Um, going back to kind of the the loan issue, uh, student loan debt uh, from the federal government, that kind of thing. You know, something that appeals to a lot of people like myself, millennials, when we think about student loan, I mean, even really good reformed Protestant Christians, they hear about student loan debt forgiveness and they're like, done, sign, sign me up because they're so strapped with, with student loan debt. How, how should we think about as Christians a lot of these initiatives? I mean, because to me, I just view it as pandering and it didn't even get passed. I think it got shot down. But like, like how should Christians conceive of the fact that I took on debt you know, when I was 18 for, yeah. for, you know, so much money and I didn't know what I was getting into. Now I'm strapped with it. I can't advance in the world. You know, how should Christians conceive of paying their debts, student loan forgiveness, that kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, yeah, it was an initiative that Biden, Biden attempted. He did not get it through the legal system. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. We're going to, he's going to try a number of different little sort of lesser versions. I wouldn't be surprised if we get another democratic, uh, presidential candidate that, um, that we'll see it again. Um, I think as a Christian, first of all, you, there's, there are a few things you need, you need as a Christian to say, look, my yes is my yes. <laughs> my no is my no. I'm, I'm good on my oaths. Um, when you took out that money, you promised to a set of terms, you need to, you need to be ready to keep your, your promise. Um, it is, a uh, you know, the, the Bible commends the man who's ready to swear to his own hurt. Who, who knows that, yeah, this is going to cost me, but I made that oath. I need to make good on it. And um, when we, as a culture, this, this just goes back to what I'm describing, like uh, the changing of our culture. When we as a culture can, can get to the point where we countenance just telling a whole class of people, yeah, never mind. Don't, don't worry about that. Don't think that that stops there. Don't right. think that it stays there. It's going to keep on going. And, um, and what happens is decisions that were made on the free market that got hard for us, we're getting out of them by handing them over to the government to take, to take the consequences for us. But what you're doing is you're handing your, your right to free trade over the government to decide over them because it, you weren't willing to deal with the consequences of your decision. And that's a very, very bad direction to go. It also, there, there's just a whole number of different things that go with it is the federal government gets into college education. Um, that's why the tuition is spiking is because the more federal funding you have going towards education, the more tuition will be raised to cost so much more. And what is crazy is the worse the product will be because what happens is um, the student is becoming less and less the customer and the federal government is becoming more and more the customer. The, the education will serve the ends of the federal bureaucracy, bureaucracy and not the ends of the individual student. So you're getting a, a lower quality education because their concern is not to figure out how to make you better. Their concern is to figure out how to click certain you know, metrics to keep federal money flowing. Um, those are two totally different things and they're opposed to one another. Yeah. With the federal funding, it's really interesting because it's so pervasive. It's, it's everywhere. So I guess my question to you would be, if you were to imagine that all of a sudden, you know, they come to you and they're like, Ben, we want you to just change it. Like you had your way with every institution, uh, university of Idaho, Boise state, all over the country, Ben's in charge. It's, you know, <laughs> as far as how, how they all relate to each other. What are some of the things that that need reform um, that might actually be possible? Not like not like a fantasy world where you're just gutting everything and cutting everything, but like what what would need what would be a way forward for these? Or, or are they just trapped in a spiral of this relationship with federal money? Like how can they change it? Yeah, that's a that's such an interesting little daydream to to walk down. Like yeah, if I was in charge of the Idaho State <laughs> Department of Education. Um, I think I think that you know you'd want to be realistic in in your um, trajectory. So what I would want to do would be a um, a steady um, scaling back of funding and a pushing it more towards um, uh, private tuition to cover it. 
Um, and that everybody feels like that's just merciless and you, nobody will, you know, only the rich people get educations. Um, but I look at like, um, when you look at your standard K to 12, um, private class, classical Christian school, I, I look at Logos school in Moscow where, um, my kids all went, my wife went there. Um, and I see a school that is performing at the very top of the state in, um, national merit finalists, uh, ac all academic, uh, metrics they are performing at the top. If you look at their spending per student, it's somewhere between one half to one third of what the state spends on the typical student in the public school system and doesn't get anywhere near the results. You could, the same is true with our colleges. You could reduce that spending radically and, um, and by uh, putting the burden on the school to not signal to the state or the federal government how they're performing, you could radically improve the performance in the classroom simply by slowly reducing the funding Put that money back in, you know, stop charging that as taxes, cut everybody's um, property taxes, the, the state level taxes. Um, you could put that money back in the system and I think improve the schools significantly like that. I think a big thing would be rooting out a lot of the various virtue signaling offices that take up a disproportionate amount of the budget, but don't provide any actual value to the education. Um, that'd probably be a big part of it. At some point you have to address athletics, which is a very conflicted sort of thing. Um, I love, you know, college sports are awesome. I'm going to, I'm going to go watch the WSU game um, uh, tomorrow and I'm really looking forward to it. Um, but its role in academia is twisted and weird. And I think somehow that has to get all, uh, um, you know, untangled. Yeah. It's very complicated. I mean, the joke at, at A&M even was a, uh... You know, because my granddad was a was a, a giver to the college. We like got to go down on the field and receive a plaque in his name. Um, um, but then you had Johnny Manziel come along, and now they have a brand new stadium. Um, you know, it's basically the house that Johnny built. And then even here in Boulder, we've got Dion here, and the local papers obviously touting biggest revenue day. You know, for CU <laughs> Boulder because Dion's here, and so everybody loves the money coming into the the college. Um, we'll see how it affects the town. And it's a very complicated relationship. What are the things that like incentivize a college to to have a sports program? Like, does that money go then to fund education or departments at the college? Well, the one this this is the thing you, you when you talk about college athletics, most people are thinking about your D1 star, you know, yeah. basketball, football, D1 and a handful of schools. Um what those programs do is they create a daydream in the minds of high school, young high school boys. Do I want to be a college athlete? That dream is then capitalized on by the, instead of the, the handful of a few dozen, you know, top level D1 schools, you've got a thousand or so um, D2 and D3 and NCIA and all, or NAI and all, all these different other um, much smaller divisions where, um, you know, and this is pretty, this is a really standard play for a small college and small Christian colleges do this a lot where we'll say, um, okay, uh, you want to be a college athlete. You're not good enough to play at a D1 school, which is 99.9999% of those boys who are dying to play are not good enough. And so um, you go to one of these smaller schools and they'll say, okay, we don't have a scholarship for you. Or if we do, it's like, we'll get you a duffel bag. Um you're going to have to pay full tuition, which means you're going to have to max out your student loans to pay full tuition. But we will put you on the football team. We will put you on the basketball team and you will be a college athlete. You will have the duffel bag. And guys will, um, for because of their dream of being an athlete, inspired by that D1 school, they'll, they'll go $150,000 in debt to do four years at some little school where their D3 football team probably would have been beat by, by their high school varsity team. Like sure. they're not that good. Um, and so, so that's a, and, and you'll go to these schools where 80 to 90% of the student body are athletes. Um, they have zero interest in the education and it shows when you show up in the classroom, nobody's interested in the class. They're there to play the sport. Um, right. and it's like, my joke is that it's like this, there's this little, um, 
little agreement they kind of come to between the school and the student is like, I'll call this an education if you'll call me an athlete. <laughs> and, and, they, and they're both kind of like, you know, they're yeah. not really looking very closely at it, but that's what happens in order to keep that, that student loan debt coming. Yeah, that makes sense. I, it's really interesting to me because over, like over the last few years, I think Liberty um, University has really put emphasis on their college football team. Um, yeah. I think it's kind of fun. I like seeing like, I like seeing in Texas, the Baptists play the uh, Christian Disciples of Christ at TCU, the Baylor play in TCU. I think it's really interesting. And then I'm, I always root against, uh, I think it's Duke that used to be Methodist because they're so like apostate now. I don't, I don't want to root for them. But is there a world in which NSA would ever have a a sports uh, component, an athletic component? I know there's, I think there's some like uh, intramural stuff like rugby and that kind of thing. But how have you yeah. navigated that at your own uh, college? Yeah, so we we do like that's the thing is I'm torn because I, I think athletic competition is really good and yeah. athletic competition done really well is really really good. You know, so um, I'm not opposed to that. Um, the difficulty is just keeping everything in its place and not letting things get out of um, kilter. Um, so, yeah, so we have a, a intramural program, uh, rugby, basketball, women's volleyball. And this year we're going to do a, um, a track meet at the end of the year for the students, an intramural one. Um, I love that kind of competition and um, and would love to have we, – we've had a rowing club that has competed nationally – um, so a rowing team that competes nationally. And I would love to, um, if, if our rugby guys were able to get to the point where we could field team, we have in the past actually had a rugby team that went and played other colleges. And if, if we could get there again, I, I would, I would love that. I'd be all for that. Um, but you've just got to keep everything in its place. Um, it's, I've purposefully tried to keep us in sports that can't, um, you know, rugby just doesn't have the pull of football. Um, and so by doing that, you just kind of, um, and say, same with rowing, um, you can't have it go to your head that much right. if you're yeah. great at rugby or great at rowing. It, and so you get the benefit of competition and all of that without quite as much danger of the um, of it destroying your frail ego. Um, <laughs> but uh, but I, like I said, I... I I would be game for trying more in the future. I just want to want to know where are the rails that we're that are set up so that um, we don't come, we don't end ourselves in this place of the mythical student athlete. Like, sure, a true student who is an athlete would be awesome. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. With uh, with the education people are getting at NSA, so you're offering one degree, um, and this was something I experienced. Uh, most people experience this. Even 2008, 2009, that's when I graduated from college. A lot of people just went and got an MBA, a secondary degree, um, just to buy their time to get into the workforce. But wow. originally I was like an architecture major. And I, what they told me is that that's great. You get the Bachelor of Science in architecture, whatever, but you're still going to have to go get another degree in order to be certified. Same thing with engineering. You can get the engineering yeah. degree. You still have to go to do another certification program to get the PE. So what, what at NSA, if somebody comes in and they do want to go into engineering, they do want to go into these more professional vocational disciplines, um, how do, how do students from NSA go from a liberal arts degree to, into that industry? Yeah. So we, we do see that. Um, that was one of the reasons why I wanted to add this other layer of ed accreditation was the national accreditation was proving to be an impediment to students who wanted to move on to some of those professional degrees. And so they were having to go back and do a lot more work to get in by getting the regional accreditation or regional accreditation, um, by getting that, that removed a pretty significant barrier that will help like, so for instance, if a student wants to go from NSA into medical school, um, our undergraduate degree, you would still need, I think, four or five additional college courses, but you could knock it out in a year pretty easily. Um, or you could even do it part-time at the University of Idaho alongside your NSA degree. Um, but now, because the NSA degree is regionally accredited, that plus a few other credits, you can go on to medical school. Um, engineering, there's quite a, there's a much more robust undergraduate um, component to it. it so I, we have had NSA students do NSA and then go and get that second engineering degree. Um, they've had to do a lot more work, although I think now, again, with this regional accreditation, that reduces it a little bit. Um, but I, I do think that 
um, med, med school, like I think NSA is a really good foundation now for medical school. For law, it's a really good foundation. You're, you're getting everything you need to be ready to go on to really excel in law school. Um, the MBA, I have seen a number of students do NSA, then do the MBA and have very successful careers in finance. Um, so, yeah, those, those work together for fairly well. Yeah. And that's just one of the concerns, you know, even even in Christian education, classical Christian schools, ours is an Ableside school. It One of the questions that comes up is, is the quality of education you're offering? Like, I realize it's not just a job. We're not just going for a job. We're not just here to, you know, produce results and, and make money. But at the end of the day, like parents are concerned about that. So I think it's just good to hear like, hey, there's a track for that and it's possible. Um, yeah. You know, I'll, and plus all my friends that went to bigger schools but got an English degree, and they have a job somewhere that's not Starbucks. I'm like, look at you. You're you're performing above average for your degree. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, so, so you, you know, we're told, you know, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. And and there's what I find is that that <laughs> surprise, surprise, it turns out scripture is true. I think that students who seek to be um, faithful with their undergraduate degree to serve God, love him, become be obedient the way they pursue their undergraduate degree do really well professionally um, and so one of the things I know the the standard assumption is that um, most NSA graduates go on to be teachers at classical Christian schools there's this idea that that's kind of all you've been equipped to do is to go teach at a classical Christian school I would say a it is a very very small minority of our students that are teachers and one of the reasons is because of the competitive job market fighting for NSA grads. Um, the NSA students get um, scooped up really quickly. I, sh I could just show you my inbox of CEOs and other people who are reaching out to me saying, I want an NSA student for this, I want an NSA student for this, trying to grab them because they have a natural and versatile kind of um, talent. Uh, they don't struggle for jobs even a little bit. They do quite well. That's excellent to hear. Uh, one question before we close out, um, and I want to just investigate this. I, I think I heard you talk about it a little bit on another podcast, New Founding. But in terms of the current model of government funding, we've already kind of discussed this a little bit, but it jacks up tuition by incentivizing, you know, like we got to get the federal money. It It seems counterintuitive when I say it out loud, because I'm like, if they're getting federal money, why is tuition going up? Like, how is that how does the industrial complex work? And then I want to talk about how how it shapes education, particularly, which we've already touched on, but I want to dive into like wokeness and DEI and that kind of stuff. So how how does the funding model work with the federal? If you're getting federal funds, it seems like that should help relieve tuition. Why is it the opposite? Oh, it's the opposite because schools, colleges are businesses and we know to not leave money on the table. So, um, if you if you come to me, say you were going to buy a car that I was selling for 10 grand um, and but I somehow know magically that you actually brought 20 grand in your pocket, um, the price just went up. Right. I mean, because I'm not going to leave money on the table. Right. When students come and apply to my school, I, I'm my I'm speaking as if I'm just your sure, typical sure. college. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, you, you, let's say I'm the college, you come and apply to my school, you fill out the, the FAFSA. So I know your financial situation. And I know, say that um, you qualify for 30 grand in student loans. What, what you do as a school is so I'll, I'll set my tuition at $30,000. And then whatever I think you can pay, um, the difference between what I think you can pay and what my tuition is, I'm going to give that to you as a scholarship. And if I think you can pay 25 grand, I'm going to give you a $5,000 scholarship. If I think you can pay 10 grand, I'm going to give you a $20,000 scholarship. So, um, but whatever you have in your giving your paying capacity, I'm going to try to collect by setting my tuition high and then awarding scholarships. And when I say award a scholarship, it's not really money. It's just a discount. There's yeah. no, when you get that scholarship from the private school, there's no bank account that is funding that scholarship. They're simply discounting it off the, the tuition price. It's the, it's the sweater that has a sticker price of $250, but is slashed down to $75 today. It's never sold for $250. It's just a gimmick. 
It's that's the way a lot of the college tuitions are. Um, and so it was William Bennett, um, uh, Secretary of Education under Reagan, I think, that he known for the Bennett hypothesis, where basically he's saying any time we as a federal government increase funding to colleges, we will over the next two to three years see their tuition increase by whatever that amount was. Because you, we think we're making up this gap down here when we fund it. But what we're doing is we're, we're signaling to the colleges that the gap can go up to here, the price mm. can go up to here. And colleges will raise their tuition because now suddenly we need it. Um, you know, have you, have you ever had a moment where the federal government or the state government or your local, you know, your local municipality was saying, hey, we're going to increase funding for the school. Have you ever had a school board ever in your life say, oh, we're OK, we don't need it. <laughs> right. Like every time it's like, oh, yes, that, we need that also. There's, there's, they will not say no. They will right. discover a new need for it always. Yeah. yeah. How is with the federal funding that comes into colleges and universities? How does it get? You talked about, I think, uh, CCCU, but how does it inform curriculum decisions? I mean, it, are there many strings attached when you get federal funding for a college or university? Federal funding, um, it's yeah. So. The strings are, are, are pretty complicated. And also because I don't get federal funding, I'm a, I'm, I'm a little bit <laughs> distant from the conversation. Sure. But one of the, the probably the big place you see it is in um, um, through Title IX. Um, the, the, the ruling is that basically if you receive Title IV money, which is the Pell Grants and the student loans, then you're subject to the Title IX requirements. Title IX says that you cannot um, discriminate according based on gender in the education you're giving. So this is why, for instance, every football team that is funded, you have to have equal number of scholarships for female sports. Um, and so every time you add a male sport, you've got to add a female team, you know, to balance things out. Um, th that um, what started to happen, it goes back under Obama and, and there's, different cases since then. But basically what was decided was um, when you, um, if somebody is, the, you know, the initial thing is you, you can't discriminate on gender. That then got applied to uh, sexual harassment. If, um, if there is a woman being sexually harassed on campus, well, that's your, there's an impediment between her and her education and it's because of her gender. So that was suddenly reinterpreted as Title IX. That's why um, in the early 2000s, all of a sudden, all the colleges were having to do all this. Um, uh, They're having to do the extra work to um, teach everybody how to determine consent for sexual activity. Right. And you had Christian colleges going through um, like, here's how sexual consent is given to Christian evangelical students because they take the title for money. They yeah. have to. Um, uh, you know, being conforming to Title IX. It also changed how sexual harassment cases were handled. Uh, you didn't have to face your accuser. You could just throw out charge. And you had all these kangaroo courts that were created by that. Well, then go on a little bit further. Now, when you add, add transgender, um, what even is a woman? Um, now, if a trans guy wants to shower in the lady's shower, if you're taking Pell Grants and, and federal student loans, you're... Title IX says you've got to, well, Title IX as interpreted by right, our right. system now says you have to uh, acquiesce to that. Um, and, and it goes, who knows what other new um, perversities are going to be found inside of Title IX? Because you really, you don't notice that it's there until somebody with a really imaginative hermeneutic unpacks it for you. Yeah, right. um, <laughs> but but yeah, the, the the federal money is kind of the camel's nose under the tent, and it's um, it's Title IX that it tends to all be packed inside of. Yeah, it's so hard to see because so many Christian colleges and universities take them, and it's like a one for one. It's kind of like what you were talking about with this guy in the Reagan administration. As they take the money, they shift left. They start yeah. misinterpreting the word. They start putting out programs and all this stuff, and it's just horrible to see. Um, and I wish more, you know presidents of colleges would would speak into the microphone more clearly, you know, would would stand up and say no. And if they need to backtrack or they need to cut it off, you yeah. know, better to live that way 
than to keep compromising into death. So um, really appreciate what you're doing. I increasingly hear when I'm at conferences or with other presidents, when I first became president and um, the subject of federal money would come up and everybody, I mean, I'm the only guy in the room that doesn't take it. So I know who they're talking about, but they're all <laughs> kind of like, you know, the alarmists who, and um, that conversation is shifting. And I'm now hearing colleges more and more sort of quietly trying to figure out, could we get off of the federal money? Um, tends to be the more faithful Christian colleges are starting to see this could be a problem and they're trying to figure out the strategy. I haven't seen anybody pull the trigger yet, but I sure. do think that um, it's coming. This next election will probably have a lot to say in that. Okay. That's really exciting to hear. I'm glad I'm glad to hear they're at least awake because a lot of times it just seems like they're a bunch of NPCs who like don't really care and they're yeah. just going to take all the money. Yeah. And, uh, so that's good to hear that those conversations are actually happening. Well, Ben, this was wonderful to have you on the show today. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Where can people find out more about either you or if they want to keep up with you or NSA, where should people go to find out more? Definitely hit the webpage, nsa.edu, nsa.edu, uh, not nsa.gov, you know, not that one. <laughs> um, nsa.edu uh, webpage. You can learn all, all about us. And especially if you want to keep up with the conversation, uh, subscribe to our newsletter and you'll get uh, a regular drip, um, you know, feeding you on our take on the state of higher ed. Excellent. All right, Ben, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Absolutely. Well, thanks for tuning in today for our conversation with Ben Merkel. I hope this episode helped you understand the state of Christian higher education in America better, especially what they're doing at New St. Andrews. It's really an impressive thing they've got going on with such a small student body. And so it's uh, really inspires me to hope and encourages me to see what's possible. Hey, if you enjoy this show, give it a great rating, subscribe on YouTube. I'm almost at that 1,000 subscriber mark, which is a benchmark for most YouTubers. So get on there and hit the subscribe button on YouTube. Uh, give the podcast a great rating, share it with a friend. And I'd love it if you'd sign up on the Patreon. $5 tier gets you a sticker, 15 gets you a mug. And you can also chime into the conversation on Patreon, get early release episodes on the Patreon as well. So make sure you sign up on the Patreon. It's in the show notes, and we'll see you next time.